News of the day. Mr. Zimmerman, have you made a decision as to whether or not you want to testify in this case? With values that never die. There are certainly a lot of controversies or scandals brewing right now when it comes to the Obama administration. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Dealing with the federal government is not always high tech. And it's not always user friendly. The stories that matter. This is a massive escalation in the tension here in Egypt. The issues that count. I don't know why the media tries to make this into a sensation. We have never hidden the fact that we supply Syria with weapons. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. He's got the red, white, blue, flying high on a farm. Semper Fi tattooed on his left. Welcome to American Heartland. This is Dr. Grace, the editor of politics and culture at worldtribune.com. This week, the president delivered a State of the Union address, which was viewed by fewer people than any other of his previous States of the Union addresses. And we predicted that. In fact, the news coming out of this week is that the president is becoming increasingly irrelevant. His State of the Union talked a great deal about the middle class. And it led me to ask this question. What class am I in? What class are you in? Since this president has taken office, there's been so much discussion about class. A discussion that we previously did not engage in. And I even hear Republicans picking up the language of class. Well, when I was a a young woman in college... One of my professors, once in a conversation we were having, he knew that I came from an immigrant family. My father had immigrated from Italy to Canada. And just as part of that conversation, he turned to me and he said, well, you know, someone like you, part of the working class. And I froze in my tracks. And I thought to myself, working class? I'm not part of the working class. I didn't say anything at the time, but why did I react that way? Well, my dad indeed had worked with his hands for so much of his life. He had been a construction worker, but over time, he provided better and better for his family. Eventually, his hands built homes that he rented out, and he worked essentially to manage those buildings. So if I look at the trajectory of my own life, at what point was my family in the working class? We didn't think of ourselves as part of the working class. We were so proud of his achievements. So perhaps when I was a toddler, we were working class. By the time I was in elementary school, he was a businessman. By the time I was in junior high school and high school, he was a very prosperous businessman. We could do things that our neighbors couldn't do financially. And I thought, this is the the dream of North America. When my professor said to me, you, part of the working class, in North America, there are no classes. Classes are fluid. The language of class is the language of Europe. It's not the language of the new world. Because in this country... You can start with a simple job, minimum wage job, and throughout the course of your life, your class can change. It can change to the point that you can become extremely wealthy. That's what America is all about. And yet the president talks so much about class. The whole language of class is egotistical. It's selfish. It's self-centered. His gambit is, oh, you know, my policies are going to give more tax credits to the middle class. Well, if you're part of the so-called middle class, if you identify yourself as that, it's unpatriotic. 
it's unpatriotic to simply want goodies for whatever class you're in. That's not the language of America. That's selfish and self-centered. What about those in the poorer classes? What about those that have small businesses and technically are in a much higher tax bracket but still may be struggling? This whole language of class reinforces me, myself, and I. The president's gambit is that there are more people in the so-called middle class than in any other classes, and therefore the Democrats will get more voters. But if you think about it from the point of view of sheer patriotism, I care as much about somebody in a class beneath me, somebody in a class above me. That's what patriotism is. We care for everybody in every class. We care for the citizens of the country. And I really hope that the Republicans don't fall into that trap. Don't use the language of class. Don't compete for the so-called middle class. The language of class is outdated. It's the language of a world that we rejected, a world that was not socially mobile. When this society was created across North America, Canada, and the United States, a new vision was unfurled. And that vision is that it doesn't matter what station you're born into, what class you're born into, you can do anything, you can be anything, you can aspire to have whatever you want. That is the essence of the American dream. So the President's State of the Union was not only full of class references that are, in my view, un-American and unpatriotic, but also full of illusions. He basically tried to pat himself on the back, present the economy as doing well, and his policies against terror as successful, when the opposite is true. The real story this week was not what the President said. The real story this week is that he's becoming irrelevant. Fewer people than ever before tuned in to listen. And the focus is now turning towards how will the Republicans combat the Democratic rhetoric. And one of the highlights of the night was a senator from Iowa who gave a response, and it was a very classy response. She didn't rebut the president's words, point by point, piece by piece. What she did was, she just stood there and she presented a completely alternative picture of the United States of America and a completely alternative picture of the solutions. Listen to Joni Ernst describing what Americans are really experiencing nowadays. We see our neighbors agonize over stagnant wages and lost jobs. We see the hurt caused by canceled health care plans and higher monthly insurance bills. We see too many moms and dads put their own dreams on hold while growing more fearful about the kind of future they'll be able to leave to their children. Americans have been hurting, but when we demanded solutions too often, Washington responded with the same stale mindset that led to failed policies like Obamacare. It's a mindset that gave us political talking points, not serious solutions. That's why the new Republican majority you elected started by reforming Congress to make it function again. And now we're working hard to pass the kind of serious job creation ideas you deserve. So she nailed it. Even a Democrat like Chuck Schumer had said that the president had made a colossal mistake in focusing all of his electoral capital on Obamacare. And now he's making another mistake by denying reality. The reality is what this senator has presented. 
Americans are far from satisfied with the state of the economy. And they want to see Congress function and they want to see the economy move. They want to see mobility, job creation and mobility. That is part of the American dream. And she did a really good job highlighting the many proposals that Republicans are putting on the table. They're going to steer them through the House, through Senate, right onto the president's desk. One you've probably heard about is the Keystone Jobs Bill. President Obama has been delaying this bipartisan infrastructure project for years, even though many members of his party, unions, and a strong majority of Americans support it. The president's own State Department has said Keystone's construction could support thousands of jobs and pump billions into our economy and do it with minimal environmental impact. We worked with Democrats to pass this bill through the House. We're doing the same now in the Senate. President Obama will soon have a decision to make. Will he sign the bill or block good American jobs? And there she was, right on point, focusing again and again on the word jobs. And if you notice, throughout her speech, she doesn't talk about class. She talks about how her family came from a disadvantaged position and her family rose through hard work and sacrifice to the point that she can now stand there as a senator and address the American people. That tugs at the heartstrings of American citizens. That is who we are. We recognize in that language the traditional America that has disappeared. And in fact, you even had a writer in the Washington Post that wrote, there's a key line in her speech that Republicans should latch onto. And I agree. And strange that good advice coming from the Washington Post. This is the key line. She said, you don't need to come from wealth or privilege to make a difference. You just need the freedom to dream big and a whole lot of hard work. Now, you remember that in 2012, the Democrats, they played the class card and they won with that class card. But the Republican road to victory is not to play tit for tat with the language of class. It is to stand there and say, as Americans, we care about everybody. The language of class is the language of egotism. It is the language of selfishness. It is not the language of the city upon a hill. It is not the language of the ideals that we hold dear. We reject this language. This is the language of a society, a world gone by, a society that failed. And that's why the new world was created. Americans are aspirational. They are socially mobile. They applaud success. And they're not selfish. They don't want tax goodies just for one class at the exclusion of others. The Republicans made a fatal mistake in trying to go tit for tat at who's going to represent the middle class. And the exit polling of 2012 showed that 53% of the American people, of, of, of American voters, believed that Mitt Romney was not going to have policies that favored the quote unquote middle class. And why did that campaign fail miserably? Because. He played on the Democrat playing field. The language of class is one that we stand against. That's what a free society is all about. That's what a free economy is all about. Classes are fluid. And as a result, everybody, from the individual who works with his hands at minimum wage, to the one who manages 
those individuals. Everyone can aspire to whatever it is that their heart desires. The American vision is one in which individual freedom is to be unfurled. And that freedom allows for the greatest creativity, the greatest ingenuity, the greatest social mobility, and the greatest prosperity. That is the message that we need to put forward to the electorate again and again. And we need to stand there and say, this class language is ultimately unpatriotic, un-American, selfish. It is the language of the low life. Take the high road and represent the ideals upon which this country was founded and the ideals that really stir the American people. You're listening to Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at worldtribune.com, and I'm upholding values that are never going to die. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Stand on the box, stomp your feet, start clapping. Got a real good feeling something bad about to happen. Welcome back. Well, something bad is happening. The president's foreign policy is blowing up. In another country, Yemen is on the verge of chaos. Its president has just been forced out. The entire cabinet has resigned. And you have Iranian-backed rebels which are take, who are taking over. What does this mean? This means that Al-Qaeda in Yemen is going to grow even stronger than it already is. The president said that the entire strategy against ISIS that he had unfurled was based on the so-called success of Yemen. And now we see that Yemen is collapsing and with it the entire counter-terrorism vision that this president has laid out. It has been a complete and utter failure. It was Al-Qaeda in Yemen that organized the attacks in Paris against Charlie Hebdo, the satirical magazine. And the president has said that his vision was that by simply using airstrikes and backing the president of Yemen, they would be able to curtail the influence of Al-Qaeda in Yemen. Not so. Al-Qaeda in Yemen had a huge victory, and now these rebels have overtaken the government. Those rebels are allied with our sworn enemy, Iran. And all this means that the Islamic forces are rising. They're not being stopped by anything that this president is doing. As we speak, another country burns. And it seems to be a pattern. The collapse of Yemen is extremely important because it shows that the strategy that he unfurled against ISIS in Iraq and Syria will not work. It is not working and it will not work. Anybody who has a shred of honesty We'll say that. Even NBC News cannot shy away from now telling the American people what a huge disconnect there is between what the president is saying and what the reality is. One of the reporters that I come to again and again that I use as clips on this show is Richard Engel. He's a guy that is actually on the ground in many of these hotspots. And his analysis is always spot on, dead right. 
And in this clip, which you're about to hear, he unmasks everything that the president said in his State of the Union about the war on terror. Listen carefully. Well, it sounded like the president was outlining a world that he wishes we were all living in, but which is very different than the world that you just described with terror raids taking place across Europe, uh, ISIS very much on the move. Uh, One thing the president said is that American leadership, including our military power, is stopping ISIL's advance. That just isn't the case, according to military officials I've been speaking to. Uh, They are taking new territory. Uh, The U.S. is removing, by that I mean killing, about a thousand ISIS fighters uh, in Iraq and Syria uh, every month. But they are replacing those with new recruits with 1,500 fighters. Uh, He said, the president said, instead of getting dragged into another ground war in the Middle East, we are leading a broad coalition uh, to destroy ISIL. Uh, The U.S., this was the year when 2,000 troops were sent back to Iraq, when we are being dragged back into the war uh, to leave the country, when we thought uh, we had closed the chapter on Iraq. Uh, He talked about uh, building and supporting the moderate Syrian opposition. That effectively isn't happening. Uh, There is no real support for the moderate Syrian uh, opposition. In fact, one military official told me that they are calling the moderate Syrian opposition the unicorn because they have not been able to find it. So uh, there, there was a, a, a general uh, tone, maybe even suspended disbelief. Uh, I think uh, when he started talking about foreign policy, uh, there's not a lot of success stories to be talking about in foreign policy right now. You know, NBC is trying hard to even camouflage what, what Richard Engel said. In some of their coverage, they're focusing on Cuba, Cuba, this great opening, the diplomatic relations with Cuba, trying to give the president some kind of a, you know, pat on the back. And yet, even in their coverage, as you heard, Richard Engel is laying, out, laying it out starkly. There's a huge disconnect between what the president said and what's really going on. There is no Syrian opposition that they can find that's going to resist ISIS. The so-called moderates don't exist. They don't know where they are. In fact, the training program hasn't even begun yet, partially because they don't know who they're going to choose to fight against ISIS and possibly the leader of Syria, fight them both, who they can trust. And again, they face the great danger of simply arming these folks and then allowing American arms, more American arms, to fall into the hands of ISIS. That's the risk that we face. And then the so-called, oh, we are actually, uh, this strategy is working. We're killing so many of the leaders. Their propaganda is so effective that with every every leader you kill, you have several more to take their place. As Engel so clearly said it, you're killing a thousand, a thousand five, it reemerge. So the hard truth of the matter is that without ground troops, ISIS is going to continue to grow. And what we have seen now, it should be starkly clear to the American people. You can't succeed in the war on terror, by simply saying we're going to back a foreign government like that in Yemen and use airstrikes and drones. In other words, we're going to try to win without getting our hands dirty and without too much effort. That doesn't work. It's not going to work if we try to do the same thing in Iraq and Syria. It's the exact same playbook as Yemen. We back Iraqi forces that have already failed us once, but let's try it again. Airstrikes, drones, and let's not try to get our hands too dirty. That's not how we're going to win a war. In fact, all we're doing is adding fuel to the fire because these half measures kill enough people to cause outrage and anger and bitterness and resentment against the U.S., but not enough people to win. And so what you have is another attack, like the attack in Paris. And you can bet your bottom dollar that there will be more to come. So what's the theme coming out of this week? 
the President of the United States is becoming irrelevant. What he says doesn't correspond to the facts, doesn't correspond to the facts as they unfold. Contradicts statements he previously made. Even recently, the State Department had to backtrack and say, oh yeah, we did say that Al-Qaeda core had been decimated, but uh, guess not. How irrelevant is the president becoming? Congress is now taking steps to lead America in the purview of the president, which is, he's supposed to be the commander in chief. He's supposed to lead in foreign affairs. Congress is starting to eclipse him in that. Speaker Boehner, has said that the leader of Israel will come to deliver an address to Congress. You know what that is? That is indeed a huge slap in the face to the President of the United States. What this move is about is essentially this. Congress doesn't believe that the President is going to negotiate in America's best interest in their current dealings with Iran. And so they've invited the leader of Israel to come forward to tell the American people exactly what is at stake here. The Israelis see clearly that the Iranians are marching towards a bomb and a bomb that they are going to drop on Israel. It is crystal clear. And Netanyahu is being basically summoned to the United States to give this address to Congress so that the mainstream media will be forced to cover it and be forced to have a showdown, essentially, between the reality of foreign affairs and the rose-colored glasses that the president is presenting. The Democrats are in a panic over this move. It's a brilliant move by the speaker. And this week, listen to Pelosi trying to essentially present Boehner as being wrongheaded in his maneuver when in fact he is doing what must be done in order to the, to awaken the American public to the gravity of the negotiations. Roll it. By all four leaders. So it, it's uh, out of the ordinary that the speaker would decide that he would in, be inviting people uh, to a joint session without any uh, bipartisan consultation. And of course, we always, uh, our friendship with Israel is a very strong one. The uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has spoken to the joint session two times already. And there are concerns about the fact that this, uh, as I understand it from this morning, that uh, this presentation will take place within two weeks of the election in Israel. I, I don't think that's appropriate for any country. Since when? I mean, look, the Speaker of the House it has awesome power. I know that. I've been there. The fact, <coughs> though, is, is that that power is not to be uh, squandered. And we lived through a period of time now under Republican leadership where they've gone outside and said, oh, we're open and transparent and all the rest, when in fact that is not the case. Well, Since when does she care about Israeli elections? What's really happening is that this move humiliates the President of the United States. In fact, a news report has a senior American official saying this, quote, There are things you simply don't do. He, referencing uh, Netanyahu, he spat in our face publicly, and that's no way to behave. Netanyahu ought to remember that President Obama has a year and a half left to his presidency and that there will be a price, he said. End of quote. So this senior American official, obviously speaking on behalf of the White House, is now threatening the Israelis. You're going to pay a price for what? For doing what? For coming to talk to the American people without consulting us. So this speech is going to be a defining moment. It is the real news of the week, emphasizing that it's not just the American people that aren't tuning in. The American people are not tuning in, but the leaders of the world are beginning to ignore him. 
I was recently asked in one of my radio interviews, what do you think is going to be Obama's legacy? Because some people said, you know what, the State of the Union was all about he laying out his legacy. His legacy is going to be that image that was broadcast around the world after the Paris attack. Leaders around the world were walking arm in arm in a massive rally against terrorism. And the president of the United States was not there. That is his legacy. American retreat, American absence in the key moments. And you know what that leads to eventually? He being ignored. Americans being surpassed by other leaders who are taking the initiative and taking charge as we saw Putin do, as we're now seeing leaders in Europe do, as we're now seeing Netanyahu do, willing to risk the scorn and animus of the White House in order to come to deliver an alarming message directly to Congress, directly to the American people. Essentially, the president, with his, his, his illusions and his lies, has rendered himself irrelevant. His porn, foreign policy is in shambles, clear for everybody to see. This is Dr. Grace upholding values that won't die. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Welcome back to American Heartland. This is Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. Well, today we are happy to have our guest, Theodore Schubat. He is the communications director for RescueChristians.org. You may be familiar with the name. Yes, he is related to Mr. Walid Shubat, whom we have had on this show before. He is the son of Walid Shubat, and uh, his writings can be found at Shubat.com. In fact, he wrote a piece and produced a video about a massacre in the Nigerian town of Baga, which has not received the media attention that it deserves. And here to discuss that is Mr. Shubat. Welcome to the broadcast, sir. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure, sir. So tell us what happened and uh, tell us how you, what you're doing to bring attention to this story. Yes. yes. Well, what happened was that there was uh, in January, around January uh, 8th, um, around that time, there was a horrific massacre in the Nigerian town of Baja, in which you had Muslims who were all members of the terrorist group Boko Haram, entered the village and they massacred at around uh, 2,000 people. In just a matter of hours, really. The entire village really was burned down. Literally, the entire village burned down, set to flames. Uh, the population of Baja before the massacre, believe it or not, was actually at around 10,000 people. And now the population of that town is virtually... Uh, non-existent. The town is virtually uninhabited. Uh, and just to read to you one account of the massacre, I'll read it to you. It's a Nigerian Islamist militant Boko, a group of Boko Haram. They attacked the northeastern town of Baja for the second time in a week, leaving bodies littering the streets, according to one official. Then it says two locals said the Islamist insurgents began shooting indiscriminately and burning buildings on Tuesday evening and raids on the civilian population. They carried on into Wednesday. More than 2,000 people are unaccounted. And when they came to the town, the streets, were, they say, literally were covered with corpses. Covered with corpses. Now, this massacre took place a little bit after the uh, Charlie Hebdo situation, in which mm -hmm. you had 12 people killed, and then you had about five other people killed in a Jewish deli. And they were, people were acting as though this just started happening. They, they, just, they were acting as though, my God, we have never seen this happen before. Oh my goodness. And they were acting so disturbed. I'm thinking, wait a second. You're so shocked by a massacre in France, yet this whole time you were ignoring greater massacres in other countries, other countries that are greatly considered to be insignificant. For example, our organization, Rescue Christians, we are involved in rescuing Christian girls and other Christians who are 
enslaved, tormented, or mobs are seeking their lives to kill them, or the government is seeking their lives to kill them or put them in prison. There was one situation we dealt with in which a girl named Tanya Rubeka, she was kidnapped, she was forced to convert to Islam, she refused to become a Muslim, they tried to force her to marry a Muslim man, she refused still to become a Muslim, she was gang-raped as her punishment. Then she was sold into slavery. This is the kind of situations we deal with. Mm -hmm. She was sold into slavery. Her slave owner would every day, for weeks on end, with him and his friends would get together, and they would tie this girl to a tree, and then they would rape her, for, one by one, multiple men raping her. And then they would burn her bodies. Her body was lit cigarettes. They would lacerate her flesh with small blades. And then one day, one of the men got bored, and he carved a hole with his knife into her body and raped her through her wound. Oh my this God! This is the type of horror. And we were, and we were, and we were reporting on this story much uh, years ago, about two years ago. We 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 did this story. We we got this girl. We 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 uh, helped her reunite with her family. We paid for her medical bills to get her surgery. We helped her psychologically as well, because uh, psychologically, emotionally, she was, a dis she was a very broken girl. She still is. Mm -hmm. And, every and pe people didn't really pay much attention to this story, but, but we were telling people, this is what they do in these countries. We don't even have any clue what really happens. Also, we had another story. Um, this one happened last year. By last year, I mean 20 2014, and which there was a couple, Christian couple, who worked in Brick kilns. They were slaves in brick kilns, making bricks, kind of like the Hebrews in the book of Exodus. And uh, they were accused of blaspheming the prophet Muhammad. A whole mob of Muslims uh, took this couple, they broke their legs so they couldn't run away, and then they covered the girl in cotton. Now, why would they cover the girl in cotton? So they can make her body burn faster. And they took both of them alive and threw them in the oven in which they were putting the the bricks. And everybody was, I mean, people were shocked by the story, but we were saying, well, hold on a second. Our organization, Earth U Christians, we deal with these kind of cases. Mm -hmm. Because in Pakistan, you literally have tens of thousands of people who are slaves in these brick kilns. They're making bricks. And this is a sort of abuse that happens to Christians who are enslaved in these brick kilns. So why are we being so surprised when it happens in our neck of the woods? Why are we being so surprised? It happens all the time in other parts of the world. Just look at Nigeria. Exactly, and it's have, coming here. Now, this yeah. particular village that you were talking about, is this was predominantly uh, a Christian village? Predominantly Christians were killed? Uh, to, be, uh, to be honest, I looked into it, and I couldn't, I couldn't find anywhere that uh, specified the religion of, of the village. But we do know that, that there were 2,000 people massacred. Right, and now, Boko Haram... Understand. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Well, we have to understand that Boko Haram, they see themselves as the purest of Muslims. So they don't mind going out and slaughtering other Muslims indiscriminately because they... You have to understand the word Boko Haram is a short for a whole slogan, which means Western education is, is evil. That's really what the, their whole group's about. So any Muslim who is at a university is considered to be a kafir. He's considered to be a non, uh, not a non-believer, but like a heretic. Mm -hmm. He deserves death because he is accommodating Western education. He shouldn't be doing only Muslim education. So they're an ultra-puritanical sect. Um, but they're, nonetheless, they are fundamentalists, and they are, they are really uh, striving to follow puritanical Islam. Right. How do they compare to, say, ISIS or Al-Qaeda? What's the relationship between Boko Haram and these other groups Bo that we're becoming familiar Bo with? Yeah. Yes, Boko Haram is a Nigerian extension of Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. uh, when, you, when you look at, they're, very, they're, they're really an extension. When you look at other groups in Africa, like Al-Shabaab, Al-Shabaab really is, another, is interconnected with the Taliban, with, interconnected with Al-Qaeda. They're based also in, uh, in Somalia, but they also are beginning to kill a lot of people in the nation of Kenya. They want to de-Christianize Kenya. Right. And that's, that's why, for example, we had another massacre not too long ago in which you had around 32 people, all Christian, killed in Kenya. They were mine workers. And, what the, and here's another thing I want to explain. Um, in that, Boko Haram controls a, a huge chunk of the nation of Nigeria. And they, uh, they, the, 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 the amount of land that they control is about the size of Ireland. I mean, it's really big. It's pretty significant. And 
what they do in the areas that they control is they have these stop points, checkpoints, and they stop you at the checkpoint and they ask you, not for ID, they ask you to say the shahadatan, the Muslim creed that you have to say in order to be Muslim. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. If you cannot say the shahadatan, they take you out and kill you instantly. Now, ISIS, if you want to compare them to ISIS, ISIS has not done the type of massacres that Boko Haram has done. Now, ISIS is very, very brutal with Shiites. They will kill Shiites without any mercy, without any quarter. They will do the same thing to Yazidis. So in that regard, they're just as brutal. But ISIS, for some reason, when it comes to Christians, they will always give Christians a chance to be Muslim. We ask ourselves why. Because the main goal of Islam was to take people who believed in the Trinity, the divinity of Christ, and to make them into Unitarians. So when they see Christians, they say, these are people who believe that Jesus is God. They need to be reformed. So we're going to give them a chance, because that was really the whole purpose of Islam. But with the Shiite, the Shiite know the truth. They're Muslim, but they are corrupted Muslims. They should have known better, and they have absolutely zero mercy for uh, Shiite. So, the, so ISIS... Is that could actually be a little bit more merciful to the Christians than Boko Haram. Boko Haram will go out and kill Christians like without any chance at all. They go and slaughter them. Right. Now, 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 here's the thing, though, is that... Now, I'm not saying ISIS is good. Hear me out. What I'm saying is that if you give ISIS enough time, though, they will begin to slaughter Christians just as badly as Boko Haram. Right. Now, ISIS, let me ask you, sir, uh, yeah, what is the Nigerian government doing about... Because remember, we... It, it, came to international attention when those girls yeah. were taken, 200 Christian girls were taken from a school. And uh, there was a lot of talk about the Nigerian government going to rescue these girls. And then it's kind of dropped out of the main, uh, out of the attention of the Western media. So what is the Nigerian yeah. government doing to combat these horrors? The Nigerian government is extremely incompetent. That's for one. For one, uh, when the Nigerian government gets into... F- the reason why I know they're incompetent is because when the Nigerian government does get into firefights, Nigerian military, usually the Nigerian military will win in these firefights. And also Nigeria, uh, the, the Cameroon, the Cameroonian, the nation of Cameroon, which borders right on Nigeria, they also deal with Boko Haram a great deal. They, when the Cameroonian military fights with Nigeria, Boko Haram, they all, almost always, they win battles. They'll kill 100 guys easily in one battle. So why can't Boko Haram completely extirpate the problem? This is what I think is going on. You have, uh, Nigeria is a nation that is 50% Muslim. 50%. And the other half is either Christian or uh, pagan. Now, now the, they're in the Nigerian government. This is what, this is what I've been, been told uh, by people in Nigeria, actually. The Nigerian government uh, is filled with Muslim politicians. These Muslim politicians, at times, can be very hesitant before... Going, committing or executing a full-on attack against Boko Haram, because Boko Haram is Muslim. So a lot of these politicians don't want to go head-on and kill fellow Muslims uh, as though they're cockroaches. So you have, you have a very difficult situation in which you have Muslim politicians who are very corrupt, and they don't want to kill their fellow Muslims. And as a result, the territory that Boko Haram controls is growing? It's about the size of Ireland. Wow. Well, thank you so much for being with us today and bringing this really important story to our attention. You have been listening to Theodore Shubat. He is the communications director for rescuechristians.org. And check out his writings at shubat.com. Thank you for being with us, sir. Thanks for having me. So far. is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Well, this week... We are going to tell somebody to shut up so forcefully, so strongly, so powerfully that if it were possible, the entire country would rally 
to this shut up segment. They would literally stand up. There is a movie out there, American Sniper, which is awesome. Absolutely phenomenal. It is fabulous. I saw it with my husband and my heart was literally beating out of my chest. It's a nerve-wracking film. It's the true story of Chris Kyle, an American sniper who served in Iraq. And it is a story of an American hero, someone who sacrificed himself, his colleagues, his family for a greater good. Someone who did what his country asked him to do. Now, as plain as day, this is a phenomenal movie about an incredible man. In fact, it is breaking box office records. Americans are flocking to see it. And it's even up for multiple Academy Awards nominations, including Best Picture and Best Actor. And I think Bradley Cooper should win it, and it should get Best Picture. No question about it, Best Picture of the Year. Enter a colossal moron by the name of Michael Moore, who on the day that the movie opened, tweeted out, That snipers are not heroes. He wrote, My uncle was killed by a sniper in World War II. We were taught that snipers were cowards. We'll shoot you in the back. Snipers aren't heroes and invaders are worse. Well, the backlash against Michael Moore has been fierce and ferocious. So much so that guess who else is telling Michael Moore to shut up? It seems like Michael Moore is telling himself to shut up. What I mean is, in a subsequent attempt to defend himself, he issued out a statement in which he says, listen, listen, I wasn't talking about American Sniper. I was just talking about snipers in general, that I was taught that these people are cowards because they shoot you in the back. But the movie's great, great editing, and so on. Now he's praising the movie galore. Why? Because all hell has broken loose. In fact, you have celebrities like Blake Shelton and Kid Rock coming out publicly blasting Michael Moore. And some celebrities stay under the radar when it comes to a controversy like this. They don't want to put their head out there in the middle of a firestorm. And yet these comments are so outrageous, so deserving to be shut down, that even celebrities are coming out and saying that, what he said was absolutely unacceptable. You have an American sniper known as a legend. He had over 150 confirmed kills. That number in reality is far, great, far, far greater. He saved countless American boys by his actions. The last adjective on the planet Earth that you could possibly use to describe this sniper or any sniper serving the United States of America is the word coward. In fact, brave beyond belief is a better description. When you see this movie, what is so good about it is it recreates the incredible tension, the incredible skill at stake with every single shot that is made and the incredible risk that is taken. What is he talking about, coward? You're in a war zone when you're a sniper and you're shooting at people that are out to kill you. How could you possibly say that this is cowardly? This shows that Michael Moore's brain is so warped by his leftist ideology that he went right off of the ledge in his statement. He is so infused with this anti-Americanism and with his anti-war persona that he can't even see clearly what Americans see very clearly, that anybody who serves in a combat zone is a hero let alone a sniper like Chris Kyle who risked himself not in one tour of duty, not two or three, but in four tours of duty 
at a time in which he's doing it sheerly as a volunteer. Michael Moore, even by your low standards, you hit rock bottom. And I am telling you from the bottom of my heart, just shut up. And let's go to our mailbag. Please write to me at values that never die at hotmail.com. Values that never die at hotmail.com. We got a letter by Harrison in Alexandria, Virginia. Dr. Grace, the Tea Party is doomed to have any of their candidates be nominated for the 2016 GOP nod. America does not want right-wing Christian extremists running this country. Listen, Harrison, Christians are not extremists. And the Tea Party is not extremist. What the Tea Party advocates for is simple. Make sure that the country does not have large deficits and that it knows how to be fiscally responsible. It's a very simple message that many households apply to themselves. And as a nation, we need to apply that lesson to ourselves. They're against high taxes and high debt. This is not an extremist position. This is common sense. And we should be more than proud to have somebody like that not only win the nomination, but possibly be the next president of the United States. A letter by Ron from Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Grace, I'm with you for new blood in 2016 and support Scott Walker from Wisconsin as the GOP presidential candidate. No more Romney, no more Bushes, and no more Clintons. I couldn't agree more. And I'm interested to see what the establishment is going to do because this week, Jeb Bush and Romney are going to meet, or they're going to meet soon, forgive me. They're going to meet in Utah. And we're going to see if the establishment candidates try to form an alliance to shut out some of that new blood that we so need. Candace from Topeka, Kansas. Dr. Grace, my heart bleeds for the victims in Paris at Charlie Hebdo. We must stop radical Islamic fundamentalists. Yes, and we're going to begin by calling them for what they are, radical Islamists, something the president should start doing. Victor from Las Cruces, New Mexico. President Obama is now an international joke. Why did he not attend the march in solidarity with world leaders in Paris? You are dead right, Victor, and that decision will haunt him. Irina from Washington, D.C., I'm an American Muslim woman proud of my heritage. Stop making generalizations about my faith and my people just because a few extremists have behaved badly. Well, listen, Irina, I want you to step up and show us the alternative Muslim faith that you defend by calling out these extremists and shutting them down. Uh, James from La Mirada, California. Dr. Grace, Bill Cosby is a hero to the African-American community. In America, a person is innocent until proven guilty. Well, you're quite right, and that's exactly what I said, that he is innocent until proven guilty. However, the evidence is mounting against him. And there is no doubt that even if this whole situation never enters, it gets into a court of law, his legacy is now tarnished. Yet the image that Bill Cosby presented on the Cosby show still stands. Those things are separate. The man can be seen as different than the work that he performed. And what is very good about that show is that it presented black Americans in the upper middle class as professionals. And that's a legacy, that part of the legacy we can be proud of. Now, his entire legacy as an actor will nonetheless be tarnished by these charges because that goes to the man. Uh, So I think you can make a distinction and say there's a part of it that's tarnished, but some of his work might still remain valid. Uh, Candice... From Johnstown, Johnston, North Carolina. Dr. Grace, I grew up watching Bill Cosby on The Cosby Show and am horrified at how so many women have come forward with similar stories of being drugged and 
raped. Justice must be served. You know what's an interesting angle in all this is that there was a very talented actress on that show, Lisa Bonet, and uh, I remember there was a big uh, controversy when she left that show because she was doing such good work, and she tweeted out something quite cri- cryptic about karma. One thing I'm wondering is. Uh, so many of his co-stars that worked with him on the Cosby Show said he was fine, but I wonder if Lisa Bonet has a story to relate to us, and maybe she was misunderstood at that time. Well, thank you for your letters. Write to me at values that never die at hotmail dot com. And this is Dr. Grace doing my best every week to uphold values that are not going to die. Here's what I tell everyone. I was born by God's dear grace In an extraordinary place The stories that matter, the issues that count This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace